So in this lesson, we're going to talk about Mongoose. Uh, we are going to describe the use case for Mongoose. We are going to define a basic schema for a single model. We're going to make a to-do model, and then we're going to incorporate that into our Express To-Dos app. Uh, we're going to read documents using a model. We're going to define some default values in a schema, and we're going to define some validations in a schema. So we're essentially just setting up a basic model for our uh, to-do after we talk about what Mongoose is and how we use it. Cool. The setup for this lesson is to just open the app that we built this morning. Okay. If you need to fetch my code, you can type those two commands or just copy and paste those into your terminal, and that will sync you up with the most recent version of what I have pushed, which is current at this point. Anybody need anything, any assistance? Tony, what you got? Uh, I did git, git status. I did the last command, fetch all and git reset hard upstream. But the thing is, when you do git status, it says like a commit. It's like uh, blah, 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 routes slash users, users.js. You prefer me to share the screen, I guess? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I can't. Try it again. Wait, dinosaur time again. Which screen it is? One, two, three, three. Because I changed PCs, PCs, and then I did this. So I see the X of X factor again. Ah, yeah, you did the fetch all, but you haven't done the reset. Oh, yes. yeah, you did. It is. Okay. Uh, can you figure? Can you open your routes directory for me? Uh, routes that the on the left here, open up this folder. I think I know what the problem is. Delete that users.js. Just delete? Yep. And then type ls in your terminal. Um, and now you're good to go. So, much. so that's the other fun thing about this, is that if you have an additional file when you do that, it's not going to delete other files. It's just going to update the contents of your current directory structure to match what I have. So if you have files that I don't have, it's not going to overwrite those. So fun. I'm glad that you shared that. Ellie? Um, I don't think mine's up to date either. Like when I look at your screen, mine is not the same even when I did the git fetch. Let's check it out. Just fetch You've that. got the same thing. You've got that users.js. You need to delete that file. And then click into your controller for me, your to-dos controller. Uh, I see what you've got here. You're going to need to delete. You've got a directory in the wrong place. So go ahead and delete this controller's directory. And the contents is okay. Yep. And then if you type ls in your terminal, it should give you no x. You're good to go. Okay. Cool. Anybody else? Cool. All right. And as a reminder, if at any point you need to pull the code, those two commands will do it for you. In fact, I'll make this nice and easy, and I'll throw them in a readme, so that if you need to, you have them in a readme. Oops. Now that we have a code block, just make sure you don't take the uh, Back text. You just copy those two things. These will be in the README if you need them. Wait. All right. Let's do it. What is Mongoose? Yes. 
This is a mongoose, but not in the context of the mongoose we're going to be talking about. Okay. Um, mongoose is an object data modeling library. Okay. Because it maps object oriented JavaScript to MongoDB documents. Okay. ODM. Mongoose is a popular ODM for Node that simplifies the interaction with MongoDB databases. Okay. The reason that we use Mongoose is to make working with MongoDB's database structure easier. It allows us to do things with classes. Okay. We're going to be able to instantiate things using not specific class constructors, but class syntax. We're going to be able to say, we're defining schemas, for example, defining models. We're essentially going to be working with classes that have been defined already. And using those classes, we can take advantage of methods and properties that give us the ability to perform create, read, update, and delete operations in the database. Okay. Mongoose makes working with MongoDB easy because we get to do use JavaScript to do it. Okay. Mongoose is the go-to when performing CRUD data operations on a MongoDB database. Okay. CRUD is an acronym that stands for create, read, update, and delete. Okay. These are the four basic operations that we're going to be performing when we're working with databases. Um, the other way to do this would be to work with the MongoDB node driver. And it is wildly complicated compared to what Mongoose allows us to do. Okay, The commands are less intuitive, and it's a lot harder to work with. So Mongoose makes working with this easier. Okay. On Mongoose's homepage, it specifically says, Mongoose provides a straightforward schema-based solution to model your application data. Schema? Wait, what? Schema. I thought we, we didn't have to have a schema because we're using Mongo, MongoDB. MongoDB, does, it's schema-less. It is. But that doesn't mean that we can't benefit from a schema. Okay, Having some sort of structure to our data is actually important. So while we don't have to have a structure to our data uh, because we're using MongoDB. Remember the picture of all the mess. We don't have to have a schema, but we're going to have a schema because organizing our data specifically in like certain to have certain properties have certain values is going to protect us really when we're writing code, right? If I'm expecting a property to be an array of something and it isn't, then if I have a for each on that, when I'm iterating over things in my code and I don't end up having a, an array, it's going to break everything, right? So if something needs to be an array, I'm going to define in my schema that it should be an array. Or if it's something's going to have a property called age, right? It should have a property called age so that if I try to render something, it doesn't error out on the page, okay? We're going to provide some structure for our data to make working with our app easier. Um, in addition to making sure that we have our schema set up, Mongoose also gives us a lot of other really cool functionality. We can provide default property values. So for example, if I leave a field blank in a form, I can have a default pop-up for that. Like, uh, I don't know, uh, if, what's a good default? Let's say that if I don't put a, year, a release year for my movie, right? I, the user leaves that blank. I can have it default to whatever the current year is or something like that. Um, it, there's a lot of really cool stuff you can do with default property values. We're going to play around with some of those. Um, data validation. I can make sure by setting up a schema that my data conforms to a specific type. If the data isn't the right type, I can say, hey, don't create this document. Throw an error. Okay, so I can I can specifically safeguard certain things to make sure that only the data I want shows up in the database. Um, this next one is uh, I can't even describe to you how cool Populate is and how powerful it is. Um, Populate is a method we're going to learn about when we talk about referencing next week that allows us to just store object IDs inside of a model and run one command and turn all of those object IDs into the full document that they represent. So when we talk about referencing, the easiest way to explain that is and how we're going to use it. 
where we are storing the object ID of performers that are in a movie inside of an array called performers inside of a movie document. So our movie document, let me see if I have an example of this, because this will be a lot easier to talk about if I just pull it up. Um, Ben's going to make you all love populate. Oh, many, populate. Populate is so cool. How many times did you have uh, pretty much uh, the inception version of populate in the Clippy app? The what? Populate. Yeah. Populate. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a, that's a fun time. I'll show you the code for Clippy sometime. It's a nightmare. Um, you'll see here that when I look up this movie, Star War, the cast is not a bunch of performers. It's a bunch of object IDs. Okay. This is what we're going to do when we build this app out is, well, this is what we're going to end with. We're going to start by putting strings in there, but we're going to refactor it. This is an object ID. So by storing the object IDs of the performers that are in this movie inside of this array, I can run populate on this. And what populate will do is look up every single one of these object IDs in the database and put the full document in here whenever I return this data to the server, which is wildly powerful, okay? We'll talk about we'll talk about that next week, but just know that Mongoose allows us to use Populate, which is insane. Okay, it's wildly, wildly powerful tool to be able to query for um, reference data. Um, it allows us to create virtual properties like full name that aren't persisted in the database, but we can use for I don't know controller functions and querying things. Uh, we don't really do a lot of that. Uh, custom instance methods, static methods. Um, those again are not really things that we do very often. Uh, there might be an example of those in the auth lesson, but that's really it. Uh, it's cool to know that we can do that stuff, but we're not really going to take advantage of a lot of the really cool stuff that Mongoose has to offer just because it's a lot more advanced than what we actually need when we build our apps. Okay. We will be taking advantage of these three things absolutely 100% for sure. And this one in auth, but we'll get to that. Okay. Um, this is just the cool stuff. Let's talk nitty gritty. Okay. This is what you need to take out of this as far as your understanding of big picture stuff with Mongoose. Okay. Ultimately, our little chart that I showed you earlier, the um this this guy. This shows that our controller is going to use a model to interact with the database, okay? Our controller is going to have access to our models, and our models are what do all of the work. The models interact with the database. The model creates, reads, updates, and deletes data in the database, okay? The model is responsible for that. And the model comes to us from Mongoose. We're going to take a schema or a defined set of parameters for our data properties. And we're going to compile that schema into a model. Okay, that's what our model code is going to do. Our to-do model is just gonna be a schema where we define some properties, we define some uh, constraints, and then we compile that using a, one line of code into a mongoose model. That mongoose model is what's responsible for CRUD in our application. It's what connects to the database and does all of our work for us. Okay. Just like the little diagram I showed you. Okay. So the way this looks in code, you'd have something like this. Okay. Your model would be defined as so. You'd have const cat schema equals new mongoose.schema. Okay. We're going to import the mongoose library. That's where this mongoose is coming from. What does this look like? Class. Yeah. Nate, you would answer that after having built Snake using a class constructor. You know classes oh, all yeah. too well now. Yeah. It's a class, right? So that means that this is going to have properties and methods associated with it. And one of those things is going to allow us to turn that into what's called a model. 
And that model is also going to have that same ability to have different properties and methods associated with it because we're turning it into a class. Okay. That's why classes are important, but not something you need to remember the syntax for because for specifically for this course, because we don't, we're never going to write our own custom classes for this course, but that's what's happening here. Okay. Behind the scenes, the, all of this work is allowing us to take advantage of classes and inheritance. Okay. So we set up a shape of the data in the schema and then we export well, we, before we export it, we compile the schema into a model and we export the model. Okay. This is what we're going to do with our to-do. Okay. Then in our controller, we're able to use the model that we exported to do things like this and say cat.create. This code right here will create a cat in the database. One line of code. Wild, right? I know that doesn't seem wild, but it will. Okay. What also is special about this? We don't usually define variables with uppercase names. That also implies that it's a class. Your models will always have uppercase names, upper camel case. They will also always be singular. The only file that we will name singularly is your model. Everything else will be named plurally. That is a project requirement. Okay. You're going to see me do that in everything I code this unit and next unit. Okay. Wildly important that you follow that convention. Okay. We're going to do this with to dos here in just a second. So let's answer some questions. I need to get the picker set up so I can uh, call on people. Um, in your own words, describe the use case for Mongo Mongoose. What is it? Why do we choose to use it? Make working with MongoDB easier. Love it. Perfect. Is to create schema and model. Yeah, that too. Right. It allows us to create schemas and models and allows making working with MongoDB easier because we get to write JavaScript. It does all of those things for us. Cool. A mongoose blank is compiled into a mongoose model. Schema. Schema. And we use a mongoose blank to perform CRUD operations on a particular MongoDB collection. Model. Model. Exactly. Nice work. OK. Um. When did we do our last? Uh, top, yeah, we got we got time. We can keep moving. Let's install it. If we want to install a package, we just do npmi, right? So let's do npmi mongoose. Okay. Now, this is where the fun comes in. In order to connect to a MongoDB database, we're going to have to use a connection string. Okay, That connection string has our username and our password. Do we want those on GitHub? No. You don't put sensitive information on GitHub, or else you don't get jobs. OK? So that's what we need to do. We need to find a way to store that securely so that you all get jobs if you don't already have them. Okay, so to do that, we're going to take advantage of what's called an env file. Okay, this is an environment variable file. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to use this file to provide certain variables to our application, but not upload them to GitHub. Okay, so think of this as like a special, special way to hide information from GitHub. We don't send this to GitHub, but it's our app is going to use it so that it still works, right? Our app is going to be able to read this file, but this file doesn't get sent to GitHub. So our app runs locally, but the sensitive information we use to make it run doesn't get sent up to GitHub, OK? ENV files are critical parts to making these applications work and keeping your data secure. Okay. 
So let's do that. Let's touch dot env. And you should see a little gear up here. Looks just like that or whatever your icon is for it. Okay. You'll also notice that it should there should be some visual distinction between this file and your node modules and the rest of your files. See how they're grayed out here for me? That tells me, hey, those aren't being uploaded to GitHub. I don't I forget what it is with the GA SEI profile. But I know that those are being ignored. So I don't have to worry about them being pushed up to GitHub. Okay. The nice thing about what we're going to do here is we don't have to fiddle around with this username password crap. We can just copy our connection string in here. This is going to work real, real nicely. Okay. Um, do we have the to do's in here? I don't think it has a place where we do that. So we're going to need to add that too. Okay. Um, yeah, it does talk about that. Perfect. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go back to Compass. If you're logged in or you're connected, just click on connect and go to disconnect so that you're back at this main window that has your Atlas connection here. Okay. I'm going to click on the three dots and I'm going to click on copy connection string. I'm going to pause the recording for this part. So we've set up our ENV file. They all look like this, but we have our usernames and passwords in there. We added the name of the database in here, just like this important says. And now we're our ENV file is set up and ready to use. But we can't just use an ENV file. Okay, we have to have a special bit of code that says, "Hey, go load that." Uh, Tony, what's your question? No, uh, it's about the thing that you uh, highlighted like twice already. In the unit two uh, checklist, will we still have it also or not? Like your checklist, did we have to change this also because the checklist was really helpful. Or uh, yeah, still... we'll have this. Yeah, we'll have the same checklist. Okay, just to be cool. sure. Yep. Cool. Um, cool. So in order for us to take advantage of the ENV that we just, uh, just created, we have to use a node module. Okay. We have to install a package that reads that ENV file and adds that information to our application. Okay. And funny enough, the name of that package is called dot ENV. Okay. Just spelled out DOT instead of a period. So let's install it. We're going to do NPMI. D-O-T, E-N-V. This one's really easy to configure. Just one little line of code. Okay. So after we've installed it, we're going to go to our server JS and all the way at the top above everything else, we're going to import I'm just going to start typing it. And you'll see that .env shows up on our list. So I'm going to go down to that. And I'm going to hit slash config.js. See, it even knows. It's smart. Okay. You will have to do this manually for your dev skills lab. You will not have to do this for your project. The reason you will not have to do this for your project is because it, it is already included in your project. Okay, The auth template that we use for your unit two project code that you're going to set up has Google OAuth implemented already. And it has this package already installed. So we're doing it in this lesson so that I can explain to you how it works and why we use it. But this will already be in your project application. So you'll do this for your lab tonight, but you're not going to necessarily need to do it again. I lied. You will need to do it for flights as well, but flights will be the last time that you use it. Nate? Um, I know that this is 
sort of beyond the scope of the lesson, but when it comes to massive amounts of secure data, uh, how do large companies keep it so that no one that they work, no one that works for them can see any passwords that you have because that would be pertinent, right? Like there can't just be like one guy who has all of the banking passwords. So I'm just there curious are, how that works. I mean, there are a bazillion different ways to do that. Like that kind of architecture is not something we really cover because it's not something that y'all are going to need to learn how to do. Um, but I'd be happy to answer that at some other point if you want. We can we can chat about that. Totally. Cool. This one line of code makes our ENV file work, okay? So what this does is this says, hey, we have an ENV file. Go read the contents of that ENV file and take whatever's before the equals and whatever's after the equals and make that a key value pair, okay? And that key value pair gets added to a process that's running behind the scenes when your express server is running. It's actually called process. Okay. So we're going to access that variable and you're going to see this in a second. This is not something you need to memorize. It's just something you need to know right now. Okay. It's going to be added to what's called process.env. So this one line of code makes it so that all of the variables that we have in our env file are added as key value pairs to the process.env object that's running behind the scenes. So if I type process.env.database URL, that value will be the string that I entered in there in that env file. So I'll be able to access that from within my code without having to actually type it. So that when I push my code to GitHub, it says that my password will be process.env.database URL. That's okay to put on GitHub. That's not secure information. It's using the contents of this file, which doesn't get pushed to GitHub. And all we're going to have in our code is process.env.database URL. That's how this works. So we can put all the secure stuff we need to in here. Secret passwords, API keys, things that are sensitive and can't be pushed to, to GitHub. They all go here in this env file. We access them using that process.env. Very, very cool. All right. Let's go do that. Uh, let me add commit and push this real quick. This is configure.env module. Okay, so we talked about Mongoose. We installed Mongoose, but we haven't done anything with it yet because we need to connect. We need we have to connect to our database. And that's why we went down this little rabbit hole with the ENV thing, is to be able to connect to our database. I need a string. I have to keep the string secure. So we installed .env. We configured it. That's good. Okay, now I have my string accessible. And in order to access it, or when I access it, I need to actually use it to do something, right? I have to connect to the database. So I need a module or code that runs when I invoke it that will say, hey, go connect to the database. And that's what we're gonna do next. We're gonna create a module that loads our connection to MongoDB using Mongoose, okay? The code that we type, I'm gonna preface this again. The code that we type out in this file will be identical for every project that you do, okay? It will be, you can copy and paste the contents of this file in every single project that you do in this course. Database.js will always be the same code, full stop. Okay, so we're gonna type it out. I'm gonna explain it as we go. This is not something that you need to memorize, okay? You'll have to copy and paste this when you do it for the first time. And when you do it for flights, it already comes in the template, okay? Your auth template for your unit two project already has this code in it. We're so good to you with those templates. I didn't get a template when I took this course. I had to write all that shit out by hand. I had to do auth by hand. That sucked. Be glad y'all don't have to do that. I'm not a horrible person. Benevolent, uh, benevolent leader. Yes. Yeah. So 
let's create a directory called config. That's where our configurations are going to go. And we'll have a file inside of that called database.js. Okay. So mkdir config and then touch config database.js. So what we're going to do is inside of that database.js config file, we want to connect to the database using Mongoose. If I want to use Mongoose, I have to import Mongoose. So let's start with that. Import Mongoose. Again, autocomplete. You can take away that pesky semicolon at the end if you want. Okay. Don't type that out all the way by hand, please. You're going to spell it wrong. Use autocomplete. To connect to the database, it's just a simple one little line of code. Mongoose.connect. And I need to pass it our string. I have to put that MongoDB plus SRV slash that whole thing in there, right? But because I can't put that in there because it's sensitive, I'm going to use that process.env thing that we just talked about. So process.env. This is where I'm going to put that database URL. And because I called it database URL, this will connect me to the database using the credentials that I specified in that file. This code does that. This code right here, these two lines of code will connect you to your database. We're going to add more to this file so that it's a little bit more descriptive and shows us when we're connected because that's useful. But this will do it. Okay. How do I make this code run? Remember yesterday? I know it seems like six years ago. How do we make the code inside of a module run? Initiate it. I mean, initialize. Mm, begins with an I. Info. Import it. Import it. Imp yeah. If we import this module somewhere, it runs all the code in it. Remember when we did that with the days of the week? And I imported it, and you saw that the console log ran, ran inside of it? The same thing. If I want this code to run, all I have to do somewhere is go and import it. So why don't we go back to our server? And then right after our, we load our middleware, our logger, let's say import. We'll do dot slash, because it's in the current directory, config slash database.js. That will run the code in that file. That's it. That loads it. Technically, if your server is running right now, you're connected to your database in theory. I don't, I, I can fire mine up here. I, I don't see that I'm connected. Wouldn't it be handy if I could see that I'm connected? That way I have some sort of visual notice that everything's gone correctly and I'm okay and I should continue to code. Or if there's an error, it shows me that there's an error. That'd be handy, right? Uh, that's what we're going to do. Okay, You can start the app up. It should fire up. But all it says is listening on port 3000. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add a little bit of extra code in our database.js file that tells us when we're connected. Okay, And to do that, I'm going to first, I'm going to make a little shortcut. I'm going to say const db equals mongoose.connection. And the reason I'm doing this is because I'm going to use db over and over and over again, just so that I don't have to put connected to mongodb, mongoose.connection.name at mongoose.connection.host, mongoose.connection.port. I'm just shortening it so that this isn't like obtuse. Okay, so this just gives us a little shortcut to use. And then 
whenever the database on connected, I can run a callback function. Okay, This says, whenever there's a connection to the database, execute this callback function. I could put whatever I want in here. I could say connected to database if I want, like just leave it at that. But I want to use a little bit more specific information. I want to say, cool, we're connected to this database name at this host at this port. Okay. This gives us very specific information about our connection. Don't type that out, just copy and paste it. And you'll see if everything has gone properly and all the stars have aligned for you, connected to MongoDB express to dos at blah, 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 port 27017. And now we get to debug people that don't have it working. Who's got issues? Nobody has issues. That works flawlessly for everybody. There's no way. That's never happened. There's no way that it's, it, it's, it broke for somebody. Seriously. All right. Y'all are, I mean, that's never happened before. So kick ass. I'm sorry. Yep. Fix it. We still have this um, for 3000 is already in use problem. Okay. Um, if you type, uh, just go ahead and share your screen. Make sure your ENV is not open when you do that. Yeah, it's not open. <laughs> cool. Uh, go ahead and open up another, like split your terminal with that little split button. And in the right terminal, type kill all space node. And then in the left terminal, go ahead and node mod again. Oh, fun. Okay. So go ahead and uh, do control C to shut the server on the left down. And what we're going to have to do, sometimes kill all node doesn't work. So what we're going to have to do is manually go in and do this. So go ahead and hit command space to pull up your uh, search doodad and then type activity. And go to your activity monitor. And then in the search field on the right, type node. And then I want you to click on the process on the process name, all the way on the left. And then can you right click on it? Uh, uh, go ahead and hit X or X out of that, sorry. Click on this button and force quit. And you may need to do it for the other one, too. Oh, no, it went away. I bet you if you try to fire it up now, it works. And you're connected to your database. Nice work. Cool. Yeah. Yep. Magunta, what you got? Hey, hi. Uh, I'm getting on your, like, a... Uh... My app is crashed. Okay, share your screen. Cool, okay. So go ahead and scroll up a little bit in this and let's see what the error actually says. Perfect, okay. Aha. So it says here, cannot find module database.jscl. So I'm guessing that in your server on line, it doesn't give me a line number, but in your server.js, I bet you you have database.scl. Yeah, right there. So just change that to .js and it should work. 
I get rid of the C too. Cool. And then scroll all the way down in your uh, terminal. Sorry. You're good to go. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool. Everybody's connected. All right. I, I'm impressed. That's the first time that's ever happened. 12 cohorts. There's always an error. Um, cool. You know what? That that calls for a break. Be back in nine minutes, 10 past. Let us continue. So we have connected to our database, verified that we have that connection here with our little message in the console. And I just want to reiterate this. This code inside of this database module is as it looks in the template and as it will look in every application that you build in this course. Okay, so we have finished writing this. This is not something that you need to memorize how to write. You can literally copy and paste this into all of your apps without having to change anything. So don't stress out that this is a lot of code. Okay, it's just copying and pasting. Um, <clears throat> question though, like mm -hmm. just to copy that, but what about like the E and V? Like we, we would have to do that prior to just copying and pasting into the data database. Uh, you would have to, yeah, you're going to have to add an ENV file and configure it. And the only thing that you have to change in your ENV file is that the name of the database, that little tidbit. So where we put express to do's here, you would just change that to whatever the name of the database you want to create for whatever you're working on is. Okay. Got it. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool. So what is the advantage of putting this in its own separate little file? There's a three-word answer here that would make me Separation overjoyed. Separation of concerns? Yes, exactly. Separation of concerns. Air high five. Cool. We're separating our concerns. This code is all its job is to connect to a database. So let's put it in a module. Okay, beautiful. And then this other question, what method on the mongoose object connects to a DB? Like it's connect. We don't need to know that because you're never going to need to write this code. I need to change that question to something better. Um, but anyway, good stuff. Okay, so we're connected. Let's define a schema. Let's start shaping our data. and. This is where we have some decisions to make as far as like when we start building apps and on our own, okay? We're gonna define our schema and that's something that you should do before you start any of your CRUD operations. But we have to think about what which operation we wanna do first. Once we have our schema defined, do we wanna try to read data first or do we wanna try to create data first? And why? Let's have a discussion about this. What do y'all think? There's not a right answer here. Could you repeat the question, please? Sure. We're going to create our schema in this next step. It's going to define the shape of our data. The schema is going to be exported to a model, compiled and, and exported into a model. That model is going to be able to create items in the database. It's going to be able to read items in the database update items in the database, and delete items in the database. Which of those four things do you think we should do? Well, realistically, it's not going to be update or delete. Is it going to be create or is it going to be read? Do I want to be able create. to? Yeah, what makes say... you think that? Because we got to create something before we can read it. Right. Okay. This lesson starts off with reading. You're not going to have anything to look at. So why do we do that? Because it's easier. And that's one of the things that I want to highlight here. Um, we take a different approach in this lesson because we um, we start off with index. And it's easier to do than creating, because creating, we're going to have a lot more work that we actually need to do to create a resource. Because we're going to have to go through that five-step process twice. The first time is going to be, I just have to have a, a route and a controller just to render a form 
And then the second time, I have to have a route and a controller for responding to what happens when I submit that form. And that's a lot. So we start off with read here. If I were building an app on my own, I would do create first for exactly the reasons that you just said. If I don't have data to read, then what the hell am I writing a read controller for, right? That seems kind of weird to me. Um, what I will say is that if you want to test this out, um, I would be happy to paste my connection string because I have items in the database. Um, and that's we used to share that too. Like that's part of the, the reason it's set up that way is everyone used to use the same connection string, but I wanted to practice this new way. Um, I'll give you a connection string so that you can test it to make sure your app is working after we've written the read functionality. So you'll be able to do that. Cool. When you're building apps on your own, you can choose which route to take first. If you want to start by creating data so that you're able to read it afterwards, you're totally able to do that. Cool. All right. So let's make a schema. Let's shape our data. Okay. What we need to do here is we need to create a module for it first because our code is modularized, right? We have to have a model file. And in that model file, we're going to define that schema and export the model that we compile that schema into. Okay. So we've talked already kind of about what a schema is, but here's a more technical definition. A schema is a blueprint for defining the structure, data types, default values, and validation rules for documents within a collection. Mongoose schemas are used to enforce consistency and data validation when interacting with the database, ensuring that documents adhere to specific structure and contain valid data. It's a safety net. It's a blueprint and a safety net. It's making sure that all of our data is what we want it to be. Okay. So let's do it. We need a directory for models. This is it. We'll have M, we'll have V, and we'll have C. This is it, y'all. Okay. MKDIR models. Touch models to do.js. Okay. Very important. Our model is singular. It is the only singularly named file in our application. Okay, very important. We will always have a singular file per mongoose model when we define the schema, compile the schema into a model and export that model. Always name models singularly. So in our model, we know we're going to use Mongoose. So let's import it. Uh, another thing I want to call attention to here, because I haven't done this yet, uh, which is my bad. I should have said something about this yesterday, but it slipped my mind. We have a ton of files that we're working in now, right? They're all named differently, obviously. And it might be tough to keep track of which file I'm working in at any given point in time. I just want to point out that all of the code blocks have captions that show exactly what file we're working in. So if you ever have a question about that, it's literally right here in the lesson. Just to be clear, I want to make sure that everyone sees that. So just forgot to say that yesterday. Okay. All right. Moving on. We're almost done. There's not too much left in this. Okay. Mm -hmm. We've imported Mongoose. Let's make a little shortcut because we're going to need to use that schema uh, class at a couple different places. Um, so we're going to make a little shortcut for ourselves. Okay. Const schema equals mongoose.schema. See how it turned that seafoam green? Showing us we have a class. And what I want to do is I want to define my to-do schema. So I'm going to say const to-do schema equals new schema. Okay. The way that we set this up is when we are defining a new schema, we pass an object to it. And that object is going to have key value pairs 
that represent the properties that we want our schema to have. And that would be the shape of our data. I want a text property and I want that to be a string. That's it. That says, hey, all my to-dos are going to have a text property that has to be a string. Pretty simple, right? Your models are all going to follow the same guidelines. They're going to be more complicated than this, but it's going to be the same setup. Okay. What I want you to do is I want you to add a property named done with a type Boolean. Make sure that it's uppercase so that it refers to JavaScript's built-in Boolean object. Okay. I'll give you 30 seconds to do that. We could just do it together. It's typing like eight characters, right? Done. Boolean. So now each of our to-dos, this is the blueprint for our to-do items. Every to-do item that we create will have a text property, and the value of that text property will be a string. It will have a done property. The value of that done property will either be true or false. Okay. This brings up the question, well, what can I, what data types do I have access to? Okay. And there's a very short list. Okay. We have access to string, number, Boolean, date, array. It's also worth noting that you can have arrays of all of the other data types, which is kind of cool. Uh, object ID, buffer, and mixed. Okay. Object ID is something we're is explicitly going to use later. Buffer is not something that you should worry about. It's not going to be covered in this course. The same thing with mixed. We're not going to use these two. Okay. We're going to use all of the rest of these. Okay. The last three types are not built in JavaScript types, but this one is something we're going to use a lot because we're going to need to be able to put an object ID inside of a document. Also, the, the reason that we put this shortcut in here allows us to just write schema.types.objectid. So it kind of shortens this when we eventually type this out, which will be handy. We don't, we're not going to do it in this lesson, but it's we set that up because that's how we're going to have it in the rest of our code. That schema looks good to me. What do we need to do with the schema once we've defined it? We need to compile it to a model, right? Because the model is what's going to perform our CRUD operations. Let's do it. Let's take that schema and say const to do. This is capital to do, because this is the model that we're exporting, equals mongoose.model. And we're going to make a model called to do out of our to-do schema. Okay. Couple things to note here. First, this is the model. The model is always uppercased, upper camel cased, and is always singular. Second, we are naming this, again, singular, uppercase. And whenever this is created in the database that we, we make, what it's going to do is it's going to call the collection whatever the lowercase plural of this is. So I will have a to-dos collection in the database. I can show you this because I already have mine set up. Inside of Express to-dos, I have to-dos. Okay, that says 
this to do's right here is coming from me typing to do right here. It's lowercasing it and pluralizing it. This is important because if you pick an app where you have a weird plural, it's going to show that as a weird plural. It's going to throw an S on the end of it. So like, um, what's, a, what's a word with a weird plural? Thanks. Peace. Octopi. Octopi is a good one. Well, what octopi nice. is a good one because you'd have octopus, right? You'd have an octopus model. And instead of octopus, it would be octopus with an extra S at the end of it, which would look really weird in your database. Okay. So I'm just letting you know to expect that. It's it would because the singular of octopus is octopus. It would say octopus with three S's at the end of it and then in your database. So it's gonna look a little weird, just so that you know that. Okay. It's okay if you have words that are plural like that and look weird. I'm okay with it. Nate. Uh, I noticed for the built-in data types that object was not uh, among them. Um, is that because it's too non-specific? Uh, there what? will be, there aren't a lot of reasons why you would want an object there because you want it to be key value pairs. If you had an object there, you're going to have a tough time putting data in there when you're building stuff out. So you want, when you set things up, you want to have a key and a value. And that value, if it's another object, should refer to a different data structure. So if you have multiple key value pairs there, like let's say, for example, you wanted to have a, uh, you're building a Rolodex and a Rolodex has a company name, a company title, uh, and then a an index of people, right? People would be a great object data type because you'd have a, an array of objects inside of it for people, right? The better way to handle that would be to reference a person inside of that as an array. So you'd have an array of people objects and those people objects would be a separate document. So you will see objects sometimes in here. We'll show you how to do that at some point, but it's not something you should start by doing. Don't don't think about using objects in here yet. Great question, though. Cool, got it. Cool. All right. Last thing that we need to do in this file is export it, okay? Because we're going to import it somewhere else. This is how all of your models are going to look. The only difference is that this is going to be something else. And whatever you name it, you have to change the names down here. Okay. They become a little bit more complicated when we talk about referencing and embedding. But to start, this isn't wildly complicated. Yes, the syntax is new. But you don't need to memorize the syntax. You need to know how to write a model. But what I expect from you with this is that you have the examples that we're doing in class to go off of, okay? Don't try to memorize how to write this stuff. It's not worth your time. Spend your time focusing on big picture concepts. That kind of stuff is more important than, oh, I remember the exact specific syntax for writing a model and like all the code and don't do that, okay? The reason we build so many reference apps is that you have them to reference. Please don't memorize this stuff. Questions? We're going to go through it literally all of this again when we talk about movies next or on Friday or whenever we do that. We're going to build a model again. We're going to go through all this stuff again. So this is just, a, again, a small preview to it with a simple, simple model. Um, sweet. So how do we view data? Uh, we've already seen this because we've already set this up. This is instructions for doing exactly what we've already done, right? This is just connecting to Atlas or to MongoDB Compass. 
So this is just recapping what we've already all done with Compass. So cool, we've already done that. This is one way to read data. You should notice, I think you'll notice, that if you log back into this now, uh, somebody log into Compass and tell me if you see express to do's. You may need to do view reload. I don't know if you need to create a resource before it shows up in the database. Anybody? Does anybody see express to do's? No. Okay. Never mind then. You'll see it soon. Cool. Well, let's finish this out. Okay. We're going to use our model to read data instead of using our fake data. Okay. Mongoose is very, very, very powerful when it comes to querying because it makes queries a lot easier than they would be if you were using the MongoDB driver. Okay. If I want to find something in Mongoose or using Mongoose with the model, I can say with this code, find me a movie where the MPA rating is PG, the release year was less than 1970, and Bob Hope is in the cast, sort them by reverse title, limit the results to three, and only give me back the title and release year. Right? This is wildly complicated. Like doing this in a SQL query would be a nightmare. But Mongoose makes it pretty easy. Okay. This technically, this is actually Mongoose. You couldn't do this in MongoDB. But there are ways to do this in MongoDB too. Wildly powerful. We're going to start with stuff way, way simpler than this. In fact, we're not going to build any queries that even come close to this. But it's a very powerful tool. Okay. If I want to get all of something from a database, an empty query object is going to select all documents. Okay, This is what you're going to do anytime you want to imp implement index functionality. If you are finding all of a resource, all you have to do is run the find method that's attached to the model and put an empty pair of brackets in it. That returns all of the movies. That's it. There are three common ways to query for finding data. Okay. Two of them we're going to use a lot more frequently than the third. If you are trying to find all of something, the one that you're going to want to go with is find. Okay. Find also works if you specify search criteria. If I want to find all the movies that have a certain property to them or have a certain person in the cast or were made after a certain year, right? You can use find. Find is going to return multiple results. It will return an array. Find by ID will find a single document based on its underscore ID property. That will 99 times out of 100 be used in a show controller. Oh, not 90 times, no, no, not specifically. You're going to use it to find a specific resource. Let me say it that way. Okay, You're never going to find multiple things with that. It's only ever going to return one thing. Third is find one. That will return the first document that matches the query object. So if there are multiple results in the database, it's only going to find the first one that matches our criteria. Okay, There are specific cases where that's useful. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get there. It's more for efficiency than anything else. We're going to be using find and find by ID a lot. Okay, Where do you think the code that uses this find method is going to go. The controller? Yeah. 
that's what's currently happening in our controller, right? We're just using this fake data from our to-do data.js. We've been faking it right now using this and for as our model. So what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of it. Scroll by. And instead, I'm going to import my model. Okay. Notice that if I start typing this out, it gives me autocomplete. I go down to to do. And it does all of the hard work for me, puts all those nasty curly braces in there and everything. The last thing that I need to do is just tack a .js on the end of this because it doesn't like to complete this. Okay. And the reason it does that, by the way, is because it's doing that for uh, it, when we get to React, you won't need the .js. So you'll just be able to use autocomplete that way and not have to worry about it. In these backend apps, you do need the .js because Express needs it. Cool. That's our to-do model. What's the job of the model again? To get access to data. To perform CRUD operations. Yeah, on the database. Cool. So theoretically, I can use this to look up all my to-dos. Okay. Um, oh, crap. Um, do I want to show you this? Oh, I, this never got updated. Hold, please. Let me see what I use in Mongoose. I need to determine whether I want to show you dot then or async await. I'll show you both. Um, I need to talk to David about that after this lesson. Um, there are a couple different ways to write these controller functions. Okay. Um, the documentation uses dot then, but the better syntax to use here would be async await. And we're going to talk about both. I'm going to start by showing you dot then because it's already what's in the lesson and I'm not going to try to pivot off of what's in the lesson for right now. Uh, but I <laughs> may need to go rewrite some stuff tonight because I do want you to see async await um, because that's what we're going to be using in unit three. So what we're going to do is we're going to rewrite this index controller. All right. I'm going to leave the current index controller here. I'm just going to comment it out. We're going to make a new one. Rec res. Okay. This is where people are going to, this is the literally the last thing we're doing. So your brains are going to hurt a little bit from this and I get it. This is, this is a tougher thing. Um, because we haven't talked about this yet. Okay. This is this will involve promises. And I'm going to walk through this as best I can. And I think seeing this again tomorrow using async await will help uh, explain a little bit of what's going on here. So if I want to run that to do.find method, okay, and I pass in the empty curly braces, that doesn't return a an array of objects. It returns a promise that has those arrays of objects in it when the promise is resolved. We haven't talked about promises yet, which makes this confusing. Um, what you need to know about promises is that to resolve a promise, you have to use a dot then method. Okay. 
So what this is doing is essentially turning this into asynchronous code. A dot then method is a way to make something asynchronous. So that's what promises are meant to do. Okay, you have to wait for a promise to either be resolved or rejected. So what we need to do here is we need to write, and I could put it here if I wanted to, but it's going to be cleaner if I put it on the next line. That's typically the syntax you'll see is either here or the next line. So I'm going to say dot then. Okay. What this does is this says, hey, I want you to wait. I want the code to stop. This process stops and waits until this database operation has taken place. This right here, this takes an eternity in computer time. It's going to happen lightning fast. But when we remember, we talked about that, um, the latency numbers yesterday with the little squares and the pictures. And we talked about how if we wanted to send a request from California to the Netherlands, it would take like seven years or something stupid like that. If we had equated a processor cycle to one second, that's this is an eternity right here. This takes time. This is making a request over the internet for data. Okay. So what we have to do is we have to tell our code, hey, slow your roll for a second and wait. And whenever this operation finishes, it is going to return something. And the thing that it returns is to do's. Okay. So dot then accepts a callback function that we pass the parameter to of whatever the thing is that we're resolving, which in this case is a list of to-dos, an array of to-do objects. Okay. I realize this is confusing. That's okay. To-do.find will return an array of to-do items. That's its job. So we tell it, okay, once that operation has completed, take the to-dos that you've just returned and pass them to this callback function where we can do something with them. Once we have the to-dos, what do we want to do with them? Render, Render. them. Render them. So, Redis dot render to do's index. We're going to pass it to do's. As written, this should work. Not for any of you because you don't have any to do's. But if I look at my browser, And I pull up localhost 3000, it works. The to-do items that are in my database are now showing up. These don't exist on my machine. These exist in the cloud. Okay. I realize that this is a little confusing because we haven't talked about promises yet. There are a couple other things that I want to point out here. Okay, One, this can be called anything I want, but it should make sense. Okay, One of your project requirements and just general good code requirements is that your variable names make sense. If I do to do.find with empty curly brackets, that is telling my code to go find all of the to-dos. So that should return an array of to-dos, okay? Calling this to-do would be bad because it is not a to-do, it is to-dos, plural. Wildly important that you name these things appropriately or else when you get into your views, you're going to have a real tough time trying to figure out what's doing what. The other thing, there's a syntax here where there's a little shortcut you can use, okay? If you are returning something in this promise and it's the same name as what you want to call it in your view, you can just do that. It still works. I think this is a hundred times cleaner 
Okay. I don't write it like this because I want you to see that you can name this variable whatever you want. Okay. If I change this to things from DB and I change this to things from DB, code still runs. Okay. What is being returned from our query is what is being passed as data to our view. What we call it is over here. This is how we define the variable in that locals object that we pass to our view. Okay. We're going to use the same word 99% of the time here, right? It's going to be to do's, to do's, to do's. But I want you to know that this to do's and this to do's, these are the same thing. This is just what we're calling it in the view. This is different than these two. I can, I'll prove that again by just renaming this one. Notice how if I do that, they're underlined. This one's underlined because I'm not using it. It says declared but never read. And this one's underlined because it doesn't know what the hell it is. Could not find to-dos. Okay. This doesn't get underlined because this is a property that we're defining. This is saying that locals object will have a property called to-dos. This is a user-defined thing. Okay. These have to be the same. The final thing that I want to point out here is that good code has error handling. If there's something that goes wrong somewhere, I want to know. Okay. If this error is out somewhere, there's a problem, the glitch in the matrix, I need to know about it so that I can do something about it. I need to be able to debug it. And if I don't know what my error is, I can't debug it. So the way that we handle that is what's called a dot catch statement. Okay, and a dot catch statement can be used after a dot then statement. If anything goes wrong in this dot then that throws an error, that error will be caught by the dot catch statement. And that error also gets passed to a callback function where we can do something. So if there's an error, I want to console log it. And I also want to redirect, because if I don't take any action, if I don't respond to that request, it'll just hang indefinitely, and nothing will happen on the page. It'll just keep spinning if there's an error. By redirecting, I negate that, and I say, OK, there was an error. Go back to the, the root route so we can redirect. This is one way to write that. I'm going to show you another way to write that tomorrow. After I determine whether or not I want to change literally all of the unit two content. I thought this had been done already, but apparently it hasn't. So I'm going to have a long night. <laughs> cool. Nate. Got an error for you. Awesome. It's it's not that exciting, but it does exist. Honestly, this is one that I felt like I should be able to debug myself, but I looked and I couldn't. So here we are. Yes. So Cannot find module express to do slash data slash to do data imported from yada yada yada. Oh my goodness. I know what it is. I know what it is. Bam. That's got to be it, right? Yes, but no. Uh, no. It, you're right. That's what the error is. And fixing that should, if you scroll down, that should get rid of your error. You should be good, right? It should be running. But you can just scrap that file. You don't need that line at all now. Right. Okay. Cool. Welcome. Thank you. Yep. Okay. I realize we ended on kind of a heavy note there with promises. Okay. We're going to talk more about that tomorrow. So don't, don't freak out about that yet.
you're not going to have any data to look at anyway when you build your apps. So you're going to be okay. What I want you to do now, well, first off, do we have any other questions? I, I know y'all have questions because that's the fastest I've ever done that lecture in 12 cohorts. Like there weren't a lot of questions as we went. So if you have questions, please ask them. Also for silence. Okay, Carla. Are we supposed to be able to see this in Compass at this point or no? No, because you don't, you don't have any data. If you want to test it uh, in your apps, I'm going to do this. Let me uh, pause the recorder. Okay. If you do that, and you're going to have to restart your, like shut down and restart your server. If you ever make any changes to your ENV, you need to shut your, your app down and restart it. But go ahead and try that. And if that shows you to-do items, then you're set up properly. Okay. That's just connecting to my database that has data in it already. So you can use that as a test. Okay. And that would just be control C, right? To, to kill the mm -hmm. server? Ellie. Okay, so overall, you just want us to understand the concepts of how everything is moving um, to get to um, like the view. Yes, what what we've done today, and I think this is a great place for a, a recap here, um, is uh, I'll do the recap in just a second. Magunta, did you have an error or a question? No, I have an error. Share your screen. I'll do the recap after this. Um, all I see, there we go, perfect. It shows like, cannot find the model, module. Okay, so that's saying you have an error on your controllers to do's line. Uh, let's, so let's look at models to do. So open your model file. Uh, it's line two. That's your problem. Sorry. To do's dot js. You need to have dot js at the end of line two. Okay. Thank you. Cool. All right. This is what I want to do to end this lesson. I want to pull up this again. And let's talk about what we just did in terms of this, because this is what I want you to understand. Okay. What we've done today is we've built out a single controller function, a router and controller and a view for one thing. Okay. We have one full request response cycle set up. Okay. It took us all day to do that. Well, half a day to do that. Okay. You're going to see that we're able to do that wildly fast compared to what we just did uh, because we have everything stubbed up for us now. The rest of these actions are going to be a lot simpler because our routers are set up, our controllers are set up, our models set up, our views are set up. We just have to add some stuff to them. It's going to be a lot faster now. The process will start to go more quickly because we have everything stubbed up. That's what's going to be like building your apps as well. But let's talk about what we've done in the context of this diagram because this is what's important. Okay. Whenever I type an address in the browser bar, localhost 3000 slash to do's, that makes a get request, an HTTP get request to localhost 3000 slash to do's. Okay. I'm going to move this over here so I can pull the code up. We're going to look at this as we go. That request is sent and hits our server because our server is running on port 3000. We put localhost 3000 in the address bar. So it makes that HTTP GET request. If y'all, this is like the time to pay attention. If you're like spacing out right now, because I've been talking for nine hours and like you're tired, I get it. But like, this is where you pay attention for the day, okay? The request that gets sent is an HTTP request. It's a GET request to localhost 3000 slash to-dos, okay? That request hits the server, funnels down our middleware pipeline until it finds a route that it matches, which is right here. 
So this means, okay, let's go inside of that router. A get request to slash to do's has been defined to run our index controller. So we've siloed off our routes from our controllers, from everything else. And this says, whenever I have a get request to localhost 3000 slash to do's, fire off the index control function. Okay. The index controller function uses our model that we wrote to query our database for all of the to-do items. Then it returns them and we render them. When we render, our view pops up and we've used this to iterate over all of the items that we've got. And for each item in our to-do array, we're going to create an LI element using the data inside of it and some EJS. Okay. That's the code. Let's look at the diagram. Okay. I'll do this again with the diagram. So the request hits the server, funnels down our middleware pipeline, finds the router. Cool. We've identified the router we want to use because it matches the route. The router, depending on which, well, we only have one method in here right now. We're eventually going to have more. But whichever one of these routers is triggered, it will fire off a controller function. That controller function uses our model to make a call to the database, which is in the cloud, and return some data. That data that is returned is then used by the controller to generate a view, which is happening in render. That view that's generated has data passed to it so that it can be generated by EJS and turned into HTML. That HTML is then returned to the controller, which is sent back in this response. So this response generates the view and then returns it as HTML to the browser. That's the whole cycle of what we just did today. Okay. I'm going to start tomorrow by talking, it's by saying that same exact thing. And I'm going to end tomorrow by going over the same exact thing. We're going to, we're going to equate everything to this chart because this is what you need to understand and how it's happening. Cool. I know this part is confusing. Just if, if you find that like mind boggling, just block it for right now. Okay. Just copy what I have here. And instead of writing to do right, uh, what, what is your skill or whatever your lab is. Okay. We'll talk more about this tomorrow. I, I realize you're all kind of fried right now. It's okay. Good.